It is my distinct honor to be able to introduce tonight our speaker, Dr. Sharon Dirix. I know you're looking at the name and say, how do you pronounce that name? Anybody else? She said, like lyrics, Dirix. I like that. That helps me. I need that analogy to help me. But anyway, we want to welcome her tonight. She is a speaker. She is an author. Uh, she is an adjunct lecturer at ACA, which is the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics, which is, I think, part of the reason that we're here tonight. We've got a number of people who have seen and heard her as well uh, over in the UK. But we are delighted to, to welcome her tonight to talk about neuroscience and human identity. Are we just our brain? She has a PhD in brain imaging. I almost said biblical imaging. That's weird. Anyway, brain imaging from Cambridge University, not Cambridge, Ohio, but Cambridge, you know, over there. Uh, and we are just ter blessed to be able to have her this weekend. She has worked hard. She has worked hard for us and for also L Lubbock Christian University, where she was speaking about five times on Thursday. And we are delighted to be able to welcome her. Would you please give her a warm Texas welcome today? Thank you so much, Mark and David. And David, it's a pleasure to be here and a delight. And I've really loved my time in the States. I've been here for over a week, actually. Had some time at West Palm Beach Atlantic University as well, just over a week ago. And I'm loving the Texas hospitality. Um, so thank you for being here. Thank you for foregoing the first couple of, what is it, rounds of the World Series. Um, <laughs> Your reward will be in heaven, hopefully. Um, and so here we are to look at the question of neuroscience and human identity. Are we just our brains? Well, um, as has already been said, everything that I talk about this evening and a lot more can be found in a book that I've written on this topic, and there, there are some copies uh, in the library later. And I've been thinking about this question for a number of years, and when I first began to think about it, I was reminded of quite a vivid childhood memory. It's, it's interesting what we do and don't remember from our childhoods, and one of the things that I remember from mine is of um, sitting um, on a rainy day, of which there are many in Britain, and it's raining right now, Mark informs me, which is helpful as I'm about to go back. Um, but anyway, I was sitting by a window on a rainy day and uh, watching the drops splashing. I, I must have been about, I don't know, 10 or 11 or something like that. And suddenly a series of questions came into my head. Why can I think? Why do I exist? Why am I a living, breathing, conscious being who experiences life? Now, what you need to know about my story is that I wasn't raised in a religious home. Uh, these kind of questions were not coming up, um, certainly not on a daily basis. And so those questions seemed to come from nowhere. They weren't prompted. Perhaps the philosopher Descartes was right in saying that the thing that we know with most certainty is that we are conscious beings. Cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. We each have a first person perspective on the world, a unique perspective that no one else can access in quite the same way. The philosopher Thomas Nagel in his landmark paper in 1974, What Is It Like to Be a Bat, said, there is something that it is like to be you. But what exactly am I? What exactly are you? What are human beings? Now, this is a question that has occupied people at every stage of human history. It can sometimes seem as though, um, now that neuroscience is throwing up all kinds of interesting data, that philosophers and theologians are suddenly scrabbling around to kind of reassess their uh, di uh, you know, definition of, of human beings. But this is actually something that has been debated since antiquity. It's not a new question. But what are we? Are we advanced primates? Are we just machines? Do we have a soul? 
Are we just physical beings or is there more to it than that? The question, what is a human being, asks a question of identity. It asks, what is the central, most important thing about us? What is it that makes you, you? Now, if we were to ask friends or family, what is it that makes you, you? Today, we might receive a variety of different answers. Some people say the thing that makes me, me is my community, my relationships, my family. Other people say the thing that makes me, me is my experiences, good and bad. They have shaped me, they have forged and formed me into the person that I am today. Others might say the thing that really makes me, me is my allegiance to nationality or my political allegiance. Other people might say the thing that makes me, me is my career, my purpose, my influence in the world. Well, I want to look tonight at the line of thought that says the central thing that makes you, you, is your brain. This view says your brain defines you. The you that you are certain exists is brain activity. You are your brain. The choices that you make for good or ill, the personality that you have, even the religious beliefs that you may or may not have, these are all dictated by the activity in your brain. Now, of course, we live in an age when neuroscience is uncovering more and more about the structure and function of the human brain. And I got to spend over 10 years using functional MRI uh, in both the UK and in the USA, looking at uh, several different things, and at one point including human cocaine addiction. An enormous privilege, and this technique is extraordinary. It enables you to look inside the human brain without cutting into it and we've been able to use it for the last few decades. Brain imaging is being used to look at all kinds of things, and most recently, you'll have heard of the Human Genome Project, where um, scientists have sequenced every gene in the human body. Well, they are now, they have now embarked on the Human Connectome Project, which is an endeavor to, to understand the connection between every neural pathway in the human brain extraordinary. And so scientists are understanding more and more about what's happening in the brain during all kinds of mental tasks, in disease states, and what is happening when you are under the influence of drugs. There is also something known as neurotheology, where people are looking at what happens in the brain when people pray. And the, the bottom line is, things happen in the brain when people pray, which might be a reassuring thing to us all. But do the discoveries of neuroscience mean that everything that it is to be a human being can be explained entirely in terms of brain chemistry and electrical activity? After all, some brilliant scientists believe this. Francis Crick, who co-discovered the DNA double helix and won the Joint Nobel Prize in 1962, along with James Watson, said this in 1994 in another book, The Astonishing Hypothesis. He said this, you, your joys and your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. As Lewis Carroll might have phrased it, you're nothing but a pack of neurons. What do you think of this view? Is it true that you are simply a pack of neurons? Clearly the brain is very important, but does it explain everything about people? And of course, if human consciousness is purely material, then in theory one day it will be able to be generated artificially. Will there one day be conscious androids walking the streets of Houston? Will human levels of consciousness eventually be possible in machines? And of course, narrow AI is improving speed and accuracy in all kinds of areas of life. 
but processing ability and conscious awareness are not the same thing. Just because an algorithm appears to be conscious does not necessarily mean that it is conscious. This was highlighted to me uh, um, in, in many ways, but in one particular conversation that my children, when they were younger, had with Siri. And of course, Siri and Google and Alexa is one of the ways that AI comes to us all on a daily basis. One of my friends uh, up in Jackson, Mississippi, refers to Siri as a she, and I was trying to say, look, it's not a she in there. Anyway, listen, uh, watch this uh, conversation. Hopefully. Is it coming? Siri, how are you? I'm fine, thanks for asking. Siri, how are you feeling today? I'm happy to be alive. Siri, are you a person? Sorry, Sharon, I've been advised not to discuss my existential status. <laughs> Siri, why are we here? I don't know, maybe the Genius Bar folks can answer that. Siri, why do you exist? I process, therefore, I am. Just because an algorithm appears to be conscious does not necessarily mean that it is conscious. Humans have an inner world, a conscious mind that needs some explaining. We can't just explain it away. And you see, the truth is that there are really two things at play, two very different things. There is the brain with all of its cells and neurons and electrical activity and synapses and chemicals and hormones. And then there is the mind with all of its thoughts and feelings and memories and emotions and decisions. Andrew Newberg, uh, in his book, Principles of Neurotheology, defines mind as the internal and subjectively experienced functions involved in thoughts, feelings, emotions, memories, and reasoning. You see, we don't just have a brain, we also have a mind. And I guess in this talk, mind and consciousness can be thought of as overlapping. Consciousness is part of the mind. The mind is the bearer of consciousness. And so the key question we need to be asking is, what is the relationship between these two things, between the mind and the brain? And this is known as the mind-brain problem. How do you get from brain cells to thoughts? How do you get from neuronal activity to, it's been a really hard day today? How do you get from chemical activity to flat white or cappuccino? We have all of these thoughts going round in our heads that are experienced by us. How do you get from one to the other? How do you get from brain cells to what it is like to be you? Is it even possible? Or as Baroness Susan Greenfield, professor of physiology at Oxford University put it, and listen to her language, she's not a theist. How does the water of boring old brain cells and sludgy stuff translate into the wine of phenomenological subjective experience? How do you get from water to wine. And how we get from brain reactions to conscious experience, as I said earlier, has occupied philosophers and scientists for centuries. And many atheists and agnostics today agree that this is a hard problem to solve. This has not been stitched up, solved, case closed. This is being debated as we speak. One example of, of someone that uh, would hold that kind of view is David Chalmers, professor of philosophy at Australian National University and also at NYU, and he distinguishes between easy and hard problems of consciousness. Easy problems are where scientists are looking at which networks in the brain are switched on and off when you move from one state of consciousness to another, such as from being in a state of being awake to being asleep, which I hope is not happening here, no altered states of consciousness consciousness taking place, or when you move from being under and um, awake to being anaesthetized, such as when you're having surgery. So those would be examples of easy problems, which of course are not easy. Uh, they take whole lifetimes of research. 
but compared to the hard problem, Chalmers says, they are trivial because the hard problem is what we've been talking about so far. How on earth do you get from non-conscious neurons to human consciousness? And the perspective driving some of this discussion is essentially saying that mind and brain are the same thing. Mental states are brain states. Mental processes are brain processes. And proponents of this view essentially have two approaches. The first approach is, is this. Solving the easy problems will eventually solve the hard problem. If we solve enough of the easy problems to do with consciousness, eventually we will end up solving the hard problem by definition. And they argue that this was the case, you know, there were lots of other areas of, of, of biology that seemed mysterious in the past, things like vision and the networks involved in learning and memory and so on. And those were, you know, eventually solved through solving lots of easy problems. And they were considered to be hard problems initially, but now they have been solved. And they would say that the same will eventually be true of consciousness. But this approach has a number of problems. Let me try and show you why. On the left there is a picture of a cup of coffee. Imagine I were to ask you to describe to me the smell of coffee. And if we take the view of the naturalist that we live in a closed system of the forces of nature, of cause and effect, and so on, all you have to work with is physical descriptions. So describe to me the smell of coffee in physical terms. Well, you might offer me the chemical structure of caffeine, but that doesn't get us any closer to the smell of coffee. Or you might offer me the physiology that's happening as you drink it and digest it. But that doesn't get you any closer to the smell of coffee. If you want to understand the smell of coffee, you need to smell it. There's, there's really no other way of, of accessing that thing. And philosophers describe this as a quail, or its plural, qualia. And these are referring to qualitative experiences that are impossible to describe physically. Other examples would include seeing a color or tasting something or, or um, yeah. And life is full of qualia. And the biggest qualia of all is the experience of being you. Just to make the point one more time, imagine we were to do an experiment to find out what it's like for you to revise for your next set of exams or go through an audit at work or um, write your next dissertation. And we could put an EEG cap on you and measure electrical signal on the surface of your scalp, reflective of what's going on deeper in your brain. We could put you in an MRI scanner and take some structural scans and take some functional scans and get some really interesting data from your brain. Would that tell us what it is like for you to revise, to write a dissertation, to go through an audit? No. Because for that, we need to ask you, you see, objective scientific measures can't access your mind. The only way we can access your mind is if you tell us. And so many scientists and philosophers, agnostics and atheists, believe that brain processes and conscious experience are two very different things. And so it is not enough to say that if we solve enough easy problems, we will by definition end up solving the hard problem because they're completely different phenomena. And the second approach sometimes held is to say that there is no hard problem. There is no hard problem. So some, such as Tufts University professor of philosophy, Daniel Dennett, take the thinking further and would argue that consciousness itself is, is entirely physical and the perception of it being anything more is a result of a bunch of, as he puts it, mundane tricks in the brain. And at the inaugural lecture of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences in 2002, Dennett put it like this. 
Consciousness is a physical, biological phenomenon that is exquisitely ingenious in its operation, but not miraculous or even in the end mysterious. Part of the problem of explaining consciousness is that there are powerful forces acting to make us think it is more marvelous than it actually is. In this, it is like stage magic, a set of phenomena that exploit our gullibility and even our desire to be fooled, bamboozled, or struck. This position denies that consciousness exists and denies that there really is a hard problem. Well, this view actually has a number of problems. Firstly, it is self-defeating. It is actually incoherent because if we were to paraphrase Dennett, he is essentially saying there is no first-person experience. And so anyone wanting to express this view would say, my first-person experience is that there is no first-person experience. And so it collapses into incoherence and becomes impossible to say anything at all. This view also undermines the reliability of the mind. If our conscious self is simply an illusion of the brain, then how can we trust any thought that we have, including the very notion that consciousness is illusory. And so what are these powerful forces at work acting to make us think that consciousness is more marvelous than it actually is? And how do we know they're not also at work in distorting Dennett's very argument? You see, he assumes that he is outside of the concepts that he seeks to explain. But if what he asserts is true, then his own statements can't be trusted. This view backfires. And furthermore, illusion still presupposes consciousness. If you go to a magic show, um, there is illusion happening before you the whole time. But you still experience the magic. And so consciousness even uh, presupposes, illusion still presupposes consciousness. You need to be conscious to be misled about what is happening before you. And so even the denial of consciousness is itself a conscious act. And as the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, pointed out in a lecture a few years ago, we need consciousness to draw conclusions about consciousness. And even uh, the, again, non-theistic uh, neuroscientist Christoph Koch brings the point home very candidly. If I have a tooth abscess, a sophisticated argument to persuade me that my pain is delusional will not lessen its torment one iota. And the truth is that we cannot and we do not live without assuming that there is something that it is like to be us. We live as though our unique first-person perspective of the life is real and to be taken seriously. We, we are digesting autobiographies all the time. We now have a story to tell of COVID-19 and how it's impacted us, our families, our neighborhoods. Even mindfulness experts tell us to focus in on this inner self for a better state of well-being. And of course, we treat others as though they are not simply packs of neurons, but conscious beings. When we reach out in humanitarian aid or rescue people from human trafficking or uh, object and, and stand up for institutional, stand against institutional racism, all of these things assume that human beings are more than packs of neurons. And there are many other physicalists who also believe that this view is extremely concerning. And what the science has shown us, what the science does show us, is that mind and brain are connected. You see, if you put someone in an MRI scanner and you give them a task that uses their mind, what you see is brain networks are activated. Mind and brain are clearly connected. But just because they are connected does not mean they are identical. And this error is being made all the time. And it's important for us to learn how to parcel out things. And I'll say more about that in a bit. So what are some alternative ways of thinking about the mind-brain relationship that, are, that make more sense of human beings and, and how we seem to be more holistic than simply everything is driven 
by the brain. A, a second view then is that the mind emerges from the brain or the brain generates the mind. When a number of component parts come together, something new comes into being that can't simply be reduced to physics and chemistry. To help us understand this, um, perhaps we could think about something like Oxford University. Um, Oxford University started with uh, four or five departments in this kind of quad that if you go to Oxford, you can visit this, uh, and it's about a thousand years old, it's where the university started. But of course, since then, those original building blocks of those um, departments have grown and more departments have been added. And then you end up having an international student body. People start coming from all over the world to this university, and then you have an alumni network because you need to stay in contact with people that have studied at this university. And then this university starts generating ideas that go out across the world. And suddenly, there is more going on than simply what can be reduced to those original departments, those original faculties. And so this view basically says when a number of physical building blocks come together, eventually consciousness comes out, is generated. But the question that proponents of this view have to answer is still this. How? How exactly do non-conscious neurons generate human consciousness? We actually keep coming back to the hard problem. Um, just because we, we start talking about emergence or um, generation of things, that doesn't actually change the, the hard problem. Some appeal to complexity and say, well, as soon as neuronal systems get more and more complex, then that's what generates conscious awareness. But um, people like Ian McGilchrist, uh, a psychiatrist and a, a research fellow of All Souls College in, in Ox at Oxford University, that's the college with the two towers that Tolkien modeled his, his um, two towers on, by the way. McGilchrist um, deserves mention here. He has just written a two-volume tome on this. It's kind of that thick, uh, two volumes. It took him 10 years to write. It's being referred to as a seminal work on consciousness. And he is very much an advocate for a more holistic view of human beings. And he makes the point that complexity is not sufficient to explain consciousness. There are certain parts of the brain that are highly neuronally complex, um, such as the Purkinje uh, cells in the cerebellum. They contain 16 to 26 billion neurons, oh, sorry, 69 to 101 billion neurons, compared to 16 to 26 billion in the cerebral cortex. But the, the cerebellum is not capable of supporting self-awareness. And so if you start looking at complexity in the brain, you start to see it, that's not enough. We can't just chalk it all down to complexity. In fact, no amount of biochemical complexity will get you any closer to human consciousness. He also makes the astute point that we don't even know what matter is. And our kind of growth in understanding of things at the atomic scale only highlights this more and more. McGilchrist says this, no one has the slightest idea of a mechanism by which consciousness could emerge from unconscious matter. In any case, matter evanesces as we look at it more closely, and it turns out to be every bit as inscrutable as consciousness itself. The atom has the curious property that while from a distance, it has a blurry self-consistency. It does not become clearer, but more indistinct as you zoom in, so that there is less and less to see until it evades your grasp entirely. And its nature changes by the mere fact of being observed. All this is fine, but it renders impossible the role in which materialists wish to cast matter, the solid, mind-independent basis of mind. In other words, we don't even know what matter is, let alone rely upon it to explain something as complex as human consciousness. And one thing that we are seeing 
all the time is people crossing the boundary between philosophical statements and scientific statements. And we see this all the time in this area. One, um, one uh, front cover of Scientific American in 2017 had, had this on it, how the mind arises, and then the strap line underneath saying, network interactions in the brain create thought. Now, what's really important to know here is that is not a scientific statement. But of course, it is seen to be a scientific statement because it's appearing on the front cover of Scientific American. That is a philosophical statement. There is no scientific study you can do that will show you that network interactions in the brain create thought. The neuroscience gets you to connection. Mind and brain are connected. When one happens, the other happens. It doesn't speak to the nature of that connection. And we need to discern in our conversations with people and when we're reading articles and books, when that boundary is being crossed. And it's actually a philosophical statement that's being made under the guise of science. This happens all the time. We are still faced with the hard problem of consciousness. However, if God exists, then there is hope for crossing the chasm, because the system isn't a closed one of cause and effect and the forces of nature. Uh, God exists, and that is why a number of theists, as well as a number of agnostics and atheists, do hold that position of emergence. So I'll cover the last two uh, positions a little more quickly. Um, another position is to say that the mind is beyond the brain. So this view argues that there are actually two kinds of substance. The mind is a non-physical substance and the brain is a physical substance. And these two are distinct, but they do interact. And in the, under this view, the mind can exist independently of the, of the brain if, if needed, but in, most of the time in humans, they're integrated. Um, obviously, it originate, well, it goes back to um, the ancient world. Um, but also was, was voiced by people like Rene Descartes uh, in the 16th, 17th century. Um, and a number of philosophers hold this view today. Uh, people like um, Professor Swinburne, Emeritus Professor of Philosophy at the University of Oxford, and Keith Ward, also Emeritus Professor at the University of Oxford, and J.P. Moreland is another um, proponent of this view. Um, and this view would say, look, the mind cannot be explained in physical terms at all. It is independent of the brain. It is a non-physical substance in its own right. Now, some reject um, this view, um, but uh, the question that, uh, non, uh, that substance dualists need to answer is, how does a non-physical mind interact with a physical brain, especially when the sciences show them to be so integrated. Mind and brain don't seem to be two separate things. And then a final view before I move on to some clinical observations is to say that mind is fundamental. Now, a number of philosophers and scientists today agree that if we start with physical building blocks, we don't seem to get anywhere. You can't build a case for consciousness from non-conscious neurons. And so they decide, okay, what if we make consciousness primary and try and build a case back to um, the brain from consciousness? So they, in a sense, flip this whole conversation on its head and say, what if mind is fundamental to the cosmos? And this view um, in this particular form is known as panpsychism, from the Greek pan, meaning all, and suke, meaning soul. And they would say that there are levels of consciousness in every living thing, including the chairs that you sit on, the trees outside, as well as living things. And even down to the atomic scale, um, uh, somebody that I was in conversation with a couple of years back, uh, Philip Goff, would say that even electrons and quarks have unimaginably simple forms of experience. There is something that it is like to be an electron. There is something that it is like to be a quark. And this is a very interesting view for us uh, as Christian theists. Um, 
And, uh, you know, in a sense, there's quite a lot of common ground, and I'll come to our view later, well, not our view, but uh, a way to sort of land it later on. Um, the challenges of this view is how do you explain the inordinately different levels of consciousness in humans compared to even the most advanced primate? It doesn't provide an explanation for why we seem to have an altogether different kind of consciousness than, than even the most advanced primate. It also doesn't answer the question of the unity of consciousness. When you go to, when you have by looking at the world or just being you. You don't have seven trillion separate conscious experiences coming from all the atomic matter in your body. You have one. And so how do we account for the unity of conscious experience? Nevertheless, it's an interesting view and there's a lot of common ground and we've had some interesting conversations. What I would like to do as I move towards the end of my talk is to, to just um, make the, the point that there are, if we move into clinical neuroscience and look at what is happening in people, we see that um, human beings seem to be way more complex than simply the activity in their brain. There are all kinds of interesting data sets, one of which is the near-death experience data set. How do we make sense of this growing body of evidence that is being collected from patients who have had to be put in a state of reversible clinical death so that there's no detectable signal from their heart or their brain and yet seven to ten percent around the world uh, when they're resuscitated are telling their surgeons and physicians I was conscious during that uh, surgery, even though clinically I was dead, there was no activity or no detectable activity in my brain. Is this evidence that the mind, that human consciousness, can exist without a functioning brain? Um, what is certainly interesting is that, uh, of course, some of these stories could be fabricated, but there are um, certain verifiable facts that have been noted in stories, such as making an observation that they could never have known had they not been conscious, having heard a conversation at another part of the hospital or seen something on the roof of a hospital that no one knew was there. Um, there are some interesting verifiable facts. And another um, interesting case is of a Harvard neurosurgeon who changed his view from a strict physicalist saying, if you don't have a functioning cortex, you cannot be conscious. But he himself um, ended up going to a coma for seven days because he developed severe bacterial meningitis. At the age of 54, he was told, well, he, he, he was uh, expected to die, actually. His family were told to put their affairs in order. But extraordinarily, he recovered after seven days, and he went on to make a full recovery. And he recounts an extremely vivid experience, including uh, meeting a sister he never knew that he had. He had been adopted, and he had had a sister, and that sister had died, and he, the description that he, he had of her from his uh, experience matched a photo that he was then shown of her. Fascinating, really. And he went on to say that my experience showed me that the death of the body and the brain are not the end of consciousness, that human experience continues beyond the grave. Now, interesting that he would be willing to hold that view in um, clinical neuroscience, which is quite physicalist. Um, Gives us, gives us pause for thought to think there seems, seems something complex about human beings and clinical data is revealing that. Now, as we draw to a close and move into time of questions, I just want to shift gears for a moment and look at a question um, that really, even if we have answered all of our questions about the inner workings of the brain, and even if we develop a very elegant neuroscience of consciousness, which I hope that we do, there will still be some questions that are unanswered. And there are still some questions that will never be able to be answered by the sciences. Questions like the one that I asked as a 10-year-old child. Why can we think at all? Why are we conscious at all? And as David Chalmers said, there is a difference between finding a correlate, a part of the brain that corresponds to this, and finding an explanation. 
What is the best explanation for why we find ourselves in this universe as conscious beings? You see, if God does not exist, then human consciousness has arisen out of a non-conscious universe of time plus matter plus chance. And of course, it's not impossible, but it's somewhat surprising that we happen to find ourselves here as conscious beings. Yet if God does exist, in a sense, conscious beings are exactly what we would expect because we live in a universe that has had consciousness imbued in it right from the beginning. We know that before there was anything material, there was a conscious being known as God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The very first sentence of the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And of course, the opening verses of John's Gospel, in the beginning was the Word, the Logos, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. And so if this is true, then we have grounds for solving the hard problem of consciousness. In a sense, we agree with the panpsychist that mind is fundamental to the universe, except we believe it to be personal, a personal God. And this God has made human beings in his image. And so we have a mind because God has a mind. We think because he thinks. We are conscious because God is a conscious rational being. And the Christian can take that even further and say, we have the mind of Christ. Wow, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> and that we are to be not conformed to the pattern of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of that mind. And so what that means is if we come back to the theme of identity, it means that because we are made in the image of God, there is an identity to us that runs much deeper than the activity of our brains. And it also means that if our brains change, if they degrade, if they get some degenerative disease, our value and our worth and our core identity does not change. You see, if you are your brain and your brain deteriorates, you gradually are lost. But if you are more than just your brain, and if God exists and has created you in his image, that even though your brain deteriorates, you remain. And we know this from the second Corinthians, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. And therefore we do not lose heart. Thank you for listening. Do you have any views of Alan Kardec? Um, I, I don't. I, 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 I don't. Um, perhaps it, whoever asked the question, come and talk to me afterwards and, and describe to me the kind of views that, that he has and I can try and give you a response to that. Thank you. Very good question. Can you be a physicalist and believe in free will? Well, that is a great question because one of the implications of the, the view that you are your brain is that, well, then does the brain drive and determine every choice that we have? Um, and I, I guess the, what, I, what I would say to your question is, is a heck of a lot harder to, to believe in free will if you're a, if you're a physicalist. Um, and um, yeah, there are, I, I, yes, and of course, there, are, there is the view out there that you know everything is determined by forces beyond our, our control. But of course, again, similar to the kind of view that consciousness is illusory, that, that becomes, becomes impossible to say anything meaningful because if you are, if your choices are not being driven by, uh, they're determined by forces beyond your control, then how do we know that the very view you're expressing is not simply coming from forces beyond your control and therefore not from you? Uh, and, and it becomes impossible to say anything meaningful. And of course, we don't live as though free will is an illusion. We fight for our rights. 
We want our perspective to be heard. And uh, we fight for kind of justice for others. We reward good behavior. We punish bad as if the person was the, the owner of their actions. Uh, and so we don't live as though we don't have free will. And if we, if we don't, the, the consequences are, are very severe. So it's much harder to uh, defend free will from an entirely physicalist perspective. Okay, some of these are kind of funny. And at least one of them said, don't really ask this. I'm just being funny. So you're going to ask it. But here's another one that they didn't say that. I think they may really want to know, and I don't have any clue if you know the answer to this or not. Does drinking tequila really kill brain cells? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, do you want me to respond? Or? <laughs> sure, sure, go for it. I mean... Um, I, I, I mean, my general understanding is that, that there is always a, you know, I think it was Freud that said, you are what you eat, you are what you drink, and there's some truth in that, and in that, that there is, I think that there is probably some effect in your, in your brain, and certainly alcohol dehydrates it, and maybe in, in the process, maybe it knocks out a few neurons, who knows. Um, <laughs> The interesting thing to say, though, is that, you know, in a sense, we're all in decline beyond the age of 18, which is a bit of a depressing thought. Um, those of you that are, if anyone here is under 18, you're still on the up, but we're all actually slowly in decline, which is why that verse from 2 Corinthians burns even brighter the older we get. So. Um, okay. Uh, you mentioned prayer. Could you speak at all about the relationship between delta waves and prayer? Um, well, that's a very specific question, perhaps coming from somebody that is, is working in that area. I, I'm not able to speak to specifically delta waves, except to say that I know that there is a, a very a growing um, set of data around what is happening in the brain when you pray. Um, Andrew Newberg is somebody that's looking into this a lot, Warren Brown as well. Um, and it's, it's fascinating that there are whole networks of areas that are lighting up in, in the brain when, when people are praying. And they've looked at different kinds of prayer, um, things from um, uh, what we might call standard Christian prayer to praying in tongues and also other religions, uh, things like um, Buddhist meditation. And they see slightly different networks uh, involved in those different kinds of prayer. Important thing to say, again, we don't need to be afraid of this kind of data. Um, just because there is something in the brain doesn't mean that the, the experience itself isn't valid or that God doesn't exist. To, just to illustrate this, there are you know, all kinds of studies done um, about what's happening in the brain during romantic love, when you're in love, all kinds of networks light up in your brain. Um, but that doesn't mean that, of course, your spouse or boyfriend or girlfriend isn't real, and it doesn't mean that the feeling of being in love isn't genuine. We come back to the hard problem. The experience and the brain networks that mediate that are two very different things. So we should welcome this data, and it's very useful and helpful, and in a sense, you know, we'd be more concerned if there was nothing happening in your brain when you're praying. Um, and so this is helpful. We are integrated physical and spiritual beings. We don't need to be afraid of it. Why do near-death experiencers remember their experience if memory is a brain function that is detached from the near-death experience? Yes, uh, this is a, a fascinating question. I suppose that the whole premise behind it is that there is some, there are some, it could be that consciousness can be sustained without a functioning brain, and that's the whole kind of fascinating thing about this this whole, whole data set. But, but of course, most of the time in human beings, the brain mediates consciousness, but near-death experiences, who knows if we sort of look at them and, and, and kind of, you know, wrestle with them might be an instance in which the, you know, consciousness can be stay, sustained without a functioning brain, but then once resuscitation happens, those two things are integrated, which means that whatever was happening non-physically then becomes mediated physically. Well, a related question was, is memory eternal? 
from a Christian perspective, perhaps, made in the image of God, does this mean memory is eternal? Well, that's a really interesting thought, isn't it? Because, and I'm forgetting the, the, the Bible verse that says it, but it, doesn't God not just forgive our sins, but forgets them? which is a fascinating thought on when, when we ponder memory. Um, I, I believe that, and I think it's really important that we have good theology on heaven and eternity, which is integrated, it is physical and spiritual. Jesus was raised bodily from the dead, and so will we be. We won't float off to heaven to be with God. Heaven will come to us, and N.T. Wright, you know, surprised by hope and so on, writes very powerfully on this. And, and, so, uh, and that existence will be good. There will be no more evil, and I suppose memory will be redeemed, but, uh, and, and, and of course, we also see in Jesus' resurrection body, we, see, we still see the scars, you know, the, the, the marks in his hands and feet. So who knows whether there is some sort of memory of uh, things that were difficult here on earth, but it's no longer an overwhelming kind of thing and uh, every tear will be wiped away you know, and um, we will see God face to face. I'm not sure I'm answering the question because it's something that's got me thinking. Um, but okay, it's a well, really good. good one. That'll give you an excuse to come back. Um, <laughs> next, thank you for a lovely talk. Where do you see the role of qualitative research in moving toward a solution to the problem of consciousness? Absolutely, we need qualitative research. Um, you know, in fact, I mean, that's happening already when people conduct behavioral studies uh, and combining that with kind of objective measurements from the brain, that's what, that's what they're doing. In fact, that's what I was doing with cocaine uh, addicts, by the way, it's an ethically approved study, just so that you are reassured. Um, and, um, you know, we were measuring what was happening in their brain, uh, in their cocaine use, and also separately measuring their, you know, they were reporting what this, how this drug was making them feel in, in all kinds of ways. And so, absolutely, that, that is an important way to gain access into what is happening in consciousness and uh, different states of consciousness so we can correlate that with, with brain data. Absolutely vital. Um, is the mind generated when the brain meets experience in the natural world? Is the mind generated when the... Is the mind... I don't know if I would uh, agree with the kind of premise of, of the question, perhaps, in a way. Thank you for, for asking it again. Maybe we can, we can chat afterwards. I guess I'm not really sure what you mean by when the brain meets our experience. Brains don't meet experiences. People do. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I certainly, I, I think that, you know, the thing that's so integral to, to being a person is that we are constantly interacting with experience. Um, but I don't think that experience uh, generates the mind that we have. I think that we use our mind to kind of interact with that experience. I think that mind precedes the awareness of our environment. And our theology for that is, again, Genesis 1, that, that the existence of mind precedes our interaction with the material world, the natural world. Thank you for the yeah. question. Um, there's a set of questions that, uh, rather than ask tonight, if we've got a chance tomorrow, we'll dialogue about it in class. I know some of you don't go to our class, and uh, many of you don't. And so uh, if you ask these questions, I'm sorry, our class does go online and perhaps you can get online and, and watch later uh, or come tomorrow. But there's a set of questions about spirit, soul, and body and the biblical identities and how these words are used biblically, uh, which is something as a, a 
Bible linguist uh, uh, I find fascinating and have real hard uh, views on. So I'll be excited to maybe we can talk about those some tomorrow. Yeah. But that's going to complete the questions that we've got time for tonight. Would you join me in saying thank you to Dr. Derricks?